we'll be exploring. So let me sh go ahead and share my screen with y'all. And do, do, do. All right. So we're finally getting into chapter seven, but before we do, like I said, a quick recap on chapter five. So remember, anytime a federal or state official, meaning a state police officer, federal official like FBI, um, want to listen in to your phone conversations or the conversations that you're having inside your house or in a car. Anytime that they want to hear you, they have to apply for a Title III intercept order, okay, period. They have to. And that has to be executed as soon as practicable, meaning there's no set deadline, guys, and that is in large part because there can be a lot of hurdles for you as an investigator to place that wiretap in that desired location. You may have to determine, well, when is that person home most of the time? Do they have a dog? Um, what difficulties will you have to encounter when you have to put in that wiretap, right? So the courts don't put a specific time period on it. Now the intercept order lasts for tick tock, tick tock. How many days guys? 30. That's it. If you don't have what you want after 30 days, you have to go back to the court and show them that you still have probable cause and that it hasn't gone stale. Now, after that 30 days has lapsed, meaning it's ended, you have 90 days from that point to provide notice, not only to the person or persons that you wiretapped, but also give that notice, that receipt to the court, showing everything that you got as a result of that interception order. Now, there isn't a separate order that's necessary for you to go back into that location and get that wiretap or that bug back. And that's because that would be tedious. It makes sense that if you have to break into somebody's location in order to put that wiretap in place, it would make sense that you have to do that again in order to get it back, right? We just don't leave those things um, in different locations. But you have to minimize the, inter the interception. If the person is talking about something really juicy, like an affair or something uh, very soap opera-like, you can't just sit there and say, oh man, that's crazy. No, you have to limit it, okay? Meaning you can't keep listening in if it's obvious that the no information is gonna be gained from that type of interception, okay? Now, what's interesting though, is if that person starts talking about having committed other crimes, you have to go ahead, stop, and then go to the court, get another interception order, or expand the one you have in order to keep listening in because um, the courts want you to justify why you're listening into that conversation if it has nothing to do with the initial interest, okay? So if your initial interest is discovering whether or not somebody is a big drug kingpin and they start talking about child pornography ring, yeah, keep listening, but you also, as soon as it possible, have to apply to the court saying that you can continue listening in for that specific information, okay? So if exigent circumstances exist, you can go ahead and wiretap somebody without an interception order, but you that's not a, a free for all, meaning you can't just listen in anytime you want without justification. You have to apply for an interception order within 48 hours of listening into somebody's conversation out of an emergency circumstance without an interception order. Okay, y'all got it? All right, so these are the eight exemptions that you guys should be familiar with moving forward. I'm not gonna go again in depth on these, but make sure to review the PowerPoint presentation in your textbook for chapter six, um, going into the next exam, the next quiz. All right, and these are the exact questions. Now I included this for you all, and this is for your benefit. So as you research whether or not um, somebody has to have a warrant or an interception order, these are the type of questions you should ask. But the moral of the story is you should always ask the two-part CATS test. It governs everything in search and seizure, guys. All right. Now, one thing we didn't cover is GPS. Now, if a investigator wants to know where you're going, um, or perhaps where you're selling illicit goods like drugs or contraband, um, they can place a, a GPS device on your motor vehicle, right? But they can't leave it on there forever. 
The courts have said this is considered what's determined as the mosaic theory. Now, for those of you who don't know what a mosaic is, it looks like this, okay? It's a big picture that's made up of tiny little pieces, right? And so if you were just to look at this section on the top right, you wouldn't know that it can create this beautiful piece of art that's on the lower left-hand screen of your uh, of this PowerPoint, right? So taking all these little bits to, taken together, you can get the big picture. That's what mosaic theory is uh, hinting at. It's saying that if you were to look at this person and you put a GPS device on them and you see that at 8 a.m. they visit the Veterans Administration, then they go to the Republican headquarters for San Marcos, Texas, then they go to Luby's for lunch, and then they go to Methodist Church, and then they're um, at home and they have the lights out by 7.30. What person do you think would this indicate? Old or young? Old, right? And would they have a military background? Absolutely. What religion are they? You'd know. What political affiliation are they? Well, you'd know. So you can tell almost a complete composite sketch of this person based on the fact that you follow them 24 hours a day to get this specific information, right? Now this is another example. One stop, 8 a.m., daycare. HEB at Walnut, New Braunfels, Texas State University by 1145. Tuesday, well actually it's Monday, Wednesday now. Uh, four stop daycare, fifth stop PetSmart, six stop dog park. What can you garner from this information about this person? <laughs> that's me guys and that's actually a slow day right so you would know that this person has children that they live in a specific area of um, New Braunfels and that they work at Texas State University and they probably teach at those specific times so you could tell a lot about this person including the fact that they have dogs or a dog right so what the court doesn't want an investigator to have the right to do is to follow a person so long that you get information that otherwise you wouldn't get um, by placing a GPS device to determine one piece of information. So you're probably sitting there going, what does that mean? Well, I included this link and I'm not gonna play it here for you because you guys can watch it in your own time, but I strongly suggest that you watch it. So the exception right now in the courts is that as soon as you walk out your door, if somebody's video can't, videotaping what you do, then they don't need a warrant because you do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy that when you walk out the door, no one will see you, right? When you walk out the door, you are in fact in public, right? Where it's becoming sketchy is that police officers are now able to get a mosaic composite of everything you do without a warrant. And the question is, would they be able to do that otherwise? Meaning, if they were just to follow you or see you out in public, would they know, like the first example, that a person is over the age of 65, Methodist, Republican, um, goes to bed by 730? Would they know all these very intimate details about a person's life by simply video surveillance when they walk out the door? And the answer is most likely not. Um, the amount of technology that we have today has opened the door to really getting a very intimate look as to what people do and who they are. So that mosaic theory comes into play and the courts are much more hesitant moving forward, 2018, 2019 and on, as to how much of a person um, can be permitted to be videoed without a warrant today, okay? Now, there is this statement that I want you guys to read with me and a current court stands on this topic. The court, the Supreme Court ruled, the prolonged monitoring by GPS, like the prolonged targeting of video surveillance cameras, creates a complete picture of the private life of an individual. As Justice Alito wrote in his concurring opinion, we need not identi identity with, identify with precision the point at which the tracking of this vehicle became a search, for the line was surely crossed before the four week mark. I would expect whether people reasonably expect their movements will be recorded and aggregated in a manner that enables the government to ascertain more or less at will their political, religious beliefs, sexual habits, and so on. So perhaps the takeaway here, guys, is that the court will not permit an investigator to put on a GPS on a person's vehicle for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Why? because you're getting a much more intimate look into that person's life than you would otherwise with a warrant. Now with a warrant, yes, but without a warrant, nope, can't do that. 
So you can only place a GPS on a vehicle without a warrant if that vehicle is in a public space and you don't leave it on for like a week, okay? So the, the cutoff, the red flags start to wave when you're able to compile a profile of that picture, i.e. mosaic theory, that otherwise you wouldn't be able to. All right, so now our rest, right? All right, so the Fourth Amendment, which again, guys, is your Bible in criminal justice, it refers to arrest. When it says persons or things to be seized, it's not just talking about the cops arrive to your house and they start taking stuff. No, it's talking about when you're arrested, they handcuff you, you are being seized. For all intents and purposes, your freedom has been limited. You're no longer free to move around. So therefore, you as a person, your physical body has been seized. So an officer cannot arrest you without probable cause. Okay, they have to have probable cause. So an arrest, it depends on whether or not a person um, has been stopped temporarily or whether or not the officer actually intends to take you into custody. So remember that the definition of a seizure is when there's been a meaningful interference with a person's possessory interest. And guys, what's more, um, what do we possess that is more valuable than our physical bodies, right? So therefore the um, standard is probable cause, which is very high. So in order to have a formal arrest, and guys, this will be on the quiz and it will be on the exam, so know it. As first and foremost, the officer has to intend to arrest you. So if the officer intends to simply stop you and ask you where you're going, that's not an arrest. So the officer actually has to intend to take your booty into jail and book you for a specific uh, offense or offenses. Next, the officer has to actually exercise what the textbook defines as real or pretended authority. Now, I hate this term, guys. I think the textbook overcomplicates it. So basically, this means that the officer has to be in good faith when they take you in. So an example would be, if an officer stops you for speeding and they run your license and they see that you have a warrant out for your arrest, but what they don't know is that warrant was actually paid. You paid your fine and that the warrant shouldn't be there and they take you out of your car and they arrest you and take you to jail, for all intents and purposes, they have formally arrested you because they're in good faith. They would have no reason to question um, the computer response when they ran your license, okay? So whether or not they have actual authorization to arrest you or they have good faith reason to arrest you, even though, like the warrant example, it really didn't exist, you have been arrested for all intents and purposes. The third is that you're taken into custody by force or submission. So if the officer even places a finger, a centimeter worth of a finger on your physical body and you run away, just that physical contact alone has opened that door to being arrested. So you've just tried to avoid being arrested. That's an additional charge. But if you just go ahead, yeah, go ahead, take me in, then that submission also satisfies this third element. The fourth and last is understanding. Now guys, this may sound easy, right? But it gets a little tricky. So let me give you an example. For those of you who've gone to Sixth Street Austin, what is the demeanor of most people at three in the morning? <laughs> Not very lucid, right? Most people are like three sheets to the wind. So do you think that they understand they're getting arrested if they've been drinking a little too much? Answer is no. So the understanding requirement for those who are inebriated due to alcohol or if they're on drugs and they're high and they can't understand the um, action of arrest at that specific moment, this fourth requirement is delayed, okay? So when they come to, ultimately in the jail, they'll soon pretty quickly realize, holy cow, I've been arrested, right? Now compare that to somebody who has special needs. Um, somebody who has special needs, who is physically or mentally unable to understand what is going on. The courts have omitted, completely omitted that fourth requirement of understanding for those who are mentally handicapped or special needs and they're unable to understand um, the action of, a, of an arrest, okay? 
So if you're drunk or on drugs, this fourth requirement is delayed. And if you're special needs, then this fourth requirement is simply omitted, okay? So I want you to compare this first element that an officer intends to arrest you with simply restraining a person, perhaps they're fighting, and you as an officer, you don't intend to arrest them, but you're just holding them to the side. Um, if you're asking them information, like, what's your name? Where are you going? Or do you need help? Um, for, like providing assistance. If you're serving them a subpoena or summons to come to court, you're not arresting them. You're simply providing them information. Um, if you're stopping a vehicle to inspect their license or the registration, or if you're stopping a person based on reasonable suspicion, Reasonable suspicion is down here. You don't have probable cause. You just suspect that somebody might be up to no good, right? Probable cause is up here. You need this in order to arrest somebody. So if you satisfy any of those factors on the screen right now, that's not an arrest because the officer isn't intending to take you in and to book you. And again, this is just the pretend or real authority aspect. Basically, the officer has actual authority or good faith that they have justification to arrest you. And then, again, I love this picture. <laughs> um, if the officer literally just taps you, that physical touch, even as minor as it is, opens that door to the officer trying, attempting to arrest you. And again, omission versus elimination of the understanding requirement okay so what if an officer doesn't intend to arrest you but keeps you for a really long time did a stop or an arrest occur well the answer is yes so this is known as a de facto arrest and this means that an officer um, has real or pretend authority has physically tried to arrest the person or the person has submitted and the person understands that they're being arrested, right? Except if they're drunk or mentally impaired. So they're satisfying all those factors except, which one didn't I say? Intent, the intention. So perhaps they didn't intend to arrest you, but for all intents and purposes, that's what they did. So the case that broke this uh, concept open was Dunway versus New York. So imagine this, guys suspected of committing robbery and homicide. Cops show up to his door. They knock at the door. Boom, boom, boom. The neighbor opens the door and they ask for Dunway. And the neighbor says, oh yeah, Dunway's here. So Dunway comes to the door and he says, yes. And they say, um, you're not, they don't say he's under arrest. They say, we'd like to ask you a few questions. Just come down to the station with us. So Dunway says, yeah, of course, I'll go. So they don't have probable cause to arrest. All they have at this point is suspicion, okay? They don't have facts or information that Dunway committed robbery or homicide. So they put him in the back of the cop car. They take him to the police station. When they take him to the police station, they put him in a little interrogation room and they interrogate him. No attorney, no Miranda rights, none of that, but they interrogate him for hours. And when they have them on the stand, they ask the officers, well, would you have stopped him if he had tried to leave? And they said, yes. They would have tried to stop him if he tried to leave. So no, the Miranda warning at that point had been given. So initially when he came in, they questioned, 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 no Miranda right. Then hours into it, they give him his Miranda warning and they say that they would have stopped him if he had tried to leave. And he waived his right to counsel at that point. So he had incriminated himself. But the question is, was that an illegal arrest? And the answer is yes, because he was not free to leave. If you're not free to leave um, an encounter with a police officer, then you've been arrested for all intents and purposes. So, <clears throat> excuse me, what could they have done? They could have questioned him at the neighbors where he was. They didn't have to take him to to the, the station, that was unnecessary. But they took him to the station. He was not told that he was free to leave because he wasn't an arrest uh, at first. And they said that they would have stopped him had he tried to leave. So the moral of the story is if you don't have probable cause, you cannot seize a person, it's illegal. So an illegal seizure is tantamount to an arrest, okay? So there, they considered everything that he said inadmissible because what comes into play, guys, you already know this, it's the exclusionary rule. 
they violated his Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable search and seizure because they didn't have probable cause and he wasn't free to leave. So as we move forward, I want you to ask yourself, is this person free to leave? If the answer is no, that person would not feel free to leave, then the red flag should start to go up and you should think, well, this might be an illegal seizure. So some people might be familiar with citizen's arrest. Yes, a private person can make a citizen's arrest. And I'm almost hesitant to say this, guys. I want this to be in flashing neon lights. Don't do it. And this is the reason I say this. It has to be based on probable cause, right? So you as a private citizen have to fit facts and information that a person is or was committing a crime, okay? So you can even use a reasonable degree of force, right? Sounds good so far, right? But this is where the music comes in. Dun, 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 dun. A private citizen, if they're wrong, they can be sued for money and a lot of money. So a case I like to give it as an example is we had an event in which a man, a tow truck driver in Louisiana, believed that this man, this man was, had tried to kidnap this little girl, okay, on his bike. So he drove, he saw a guy on his bike, stopped, and this was a big old guy, right? Tackled the guy, held him there while police arrived on the scene, and while he was basically sitting on top of him, he actually broke one of the man's ribs, okay? So when the police arrived on the scene and the girl and the parents showed up on the scene, they realized, guess what? Wrong guy, it wasn't the right guy. So he was sued and he almost went out of business because he could be sued civilly, meaning everything that he owned, including the money from his business, was up for grabs, right? So this is why I always say, yes, you have the right, but you better be darn sure that person actually is the person that committed the offense before you even attempt to make a citizen's arrest. Now, this long slide, as I talk, I just want you guys to listen to what I'm saying. In order to arrest somebody in their home, get a warrant, okay? Um, it is very rare that you're going to have an exigent circumstance. So let's say an exigent circumstance might be that a person has a bomb on them or they're threatening some type of physical injury or death to themselves or to another person. That would require immediate action, okay? Um, another door that's been opened recently is if there's risk that the evidence will be destroyed. So let's say the person is running from the cops and they have on their person, and the police know this, they have on their person a ton of drugs and guns and they run into their house. Well, what could they easily do? Flush them, right? Flush them down the toilet. Um, not the guns, <laughs> but the drugs. So that may permit an officer to break into the house uh, without a warrant to arrest the person, okay? So these are the only type of circumstances that would open the door to a warrantless arrest. But guys, in most part, you have to have a warrant. It is the safest route to take, okay? Now we get to the nitty gritty. So I'm gonna actually stop here and I'm gonna separate this video lecture from the initial arrest presentation. So that way you guys can watch this at your leisure, okay? So this is part one in terms of arrest and the next PowerPoint lecture video will be on use of force, deadly force, because it's such a heavy topic, okay? So that's it for right now, guys.